if I can, if I can love fishing as much as I loved fishing and hunting at 16 for the rest of my life, it's all I could ever ask for. But you know, I want to have an understanding about what's happening too. And so sometimes blind casting a conventional reel is going to help you learn something that I don't know if you'd be able to with a fly rod. Cause there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. I'm like, Hey, whoa, I'm not a fly only guy. Yeah. Okay. You know, but when you're a fly only guy, you better be able to really bring it. You know, the good thing with fishing is like fishing has a way of humbling us. Right. And I kind of just had this appetite of like, man, it's just really great to, to learn from people who spend so much time on the water. And really the podcast was like my own learning journey. I, I think you got to make content that you love that you really love. I, I did it just for me. And that's like something that's really important for me now is really trying to just stay focused to that desire to say, this is, this is my own interest and journey that I'm going on and podcasting allows people to come along that. And the principle of, I think really successful people in, in a lot of ways are they hold on to something from like, just like I see my kids and just how they love things. And it's like, I just want to continue to love things the way that a child does. And I think that's really helpful in life. Yeah. That's why I agreed to this podcast. People need to know. We're here to talk about good the cheese goats, on pizza. <laughs> the goats make cheese to people. That's how you should ask it. What? De if What's you were death on death row, row they're going to let you go on a three day fishing trip. Jeez. What's the one person you're going to fish with? All right, guys, welcome to another edition of the Skiff Wanderer podcast. Today, I am joined by a podcast legend. My mom would say. I think so. And honestly, one of my good friends and inspiration and honestly, a big help in, in my own podcast, Mr. Hunter Levine of the Captain's Collective. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. How does it feel to be on that side of the mic? feels it just it feels like the same mic but from a different angle yeah you ready to answer questions i thought that was going to be profound i was really trying to kick it <laughs> off with something really profound <laughs> where'd you grow up yeah so i grew up the first five years of my life in an area outside of tampa called green swamp west so my family is five generations of the tampa bay cedar key area and my dad worked for Fish and Wildlife Commission, and we lived on land that was owned by the state, Green Swamp, and he patrolled it, and we were able to stay in a house. And so my first five years of life were miles behind a gate, like out in the middle of nowhere, which were really formative. And I think, I think they helped me fall in love with the outdoors at a young age. But when you're, when you're five years old and you live in the middle of nowhere, like you're not like... Oh, it's so nice to be away from people. Yeah. I'm like talking to my cousins and they're like, I rode my bike to my friend's house. I'm like, you rode your bike? You have a friend? <laughs> you know, that sounds awesome. What's it like? So um, after that, I lived in Crestview, Florida, which is not too far from like the Destin area of, and did that for a couple of years in elementary school and then ended up in Tallahassee, Florida, middle school and high school, went to Florida State and then eventually in my adult years moved down here south of Tallahassee to Wakulla County, which, which is, is where we're at right now. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, don't come here. No, yeah, it's it's um don't don't come here if you're a Texan. Well, we're what we could do a whole podcast on how much Florida hates me. Yeah. Um I mean you already kinda went into it, but like your dad was a your dad was a wildlife officer, so yep. you grew up hunting and fishing. Yeah, my dad worked for the Fish and Wildlife Commission. My mom um, and my dad met. They both worked for Fish and Wildlife Commission. And then um, then my dad ended up becoming a fishing guide about eight or nine years ago. And so, but my whole life, uh, he, he would take me, his kind of approach on things was he would introduce me to just like a, a wide variety of things. Yeah. And it was all about different experiences. And then I would find little things throughout my life that... I would gravitate to and then I would kind of learn about it and do it and then move on. And yeah. eventually for me, fly fishing was the thing that I think I grabbed later in life, but I grabbed a hold really firmly and it was something that had a, a certain sticking power that nothing else in the outdoor world really had. Like I went through waterfowl, we had some guys over tonight for dinner. And I have like a, a big buck in my living room that I shot in middle school. I mean, I went through some hardcore whitetail and 
all sorts of different stuff. Went, got into frog gigging in high school, you know, floundering in high school, all that type of stuff. And I had a lot of fun doing it, but I never had a hard time walking away to do something else. And fly fishing for me was really the first thing that I just was like, I don't, I don't think I ever want to walk away from this. This is a combination of all the things I liked about all the other stuff. Yeah. So it kind of all came together. Because it is, I mean, it's a little bit of hunting, a little bit of, I mean, it's a lot of fishing. And yeah. then there's, you know, like if you're, especially if you're getting into archery, like the skill set that you need to be a proficient archer plays into being a proficient fly fisher and that you got to practice, you got to be out there. When did you start fly fishing? So the when i first started fly fishing i was probably probably in middle school we used to go up to the mountains and my family on my dad's side everybody was like in this basically familial timeshare yeah of a little cabin up in pigeon forge and i fly fished a little bit during that time and then i kind of learned how to do my own um not really do my own but i was shown how to catch smallmouth up there yeah and instead of going and like catching these little trout on fly fly fishing and getting caught in the branches i was doing small mouth on ultralight gear and so i i kind of dabbled in it a little bit and i picked it back up probably around 23 22 so i've been doing it pretty heavy the past seven years but i haven't been doing it in high school like you know outside of grabbing a rod here or there or dabbling like you know it, it really wasn't an important part of my life until my adult years yeah is there like is is there any part of it that you think is like affected like your adult life like how you think and how you operate and like things you do yeah i think um when i was in high school i fished out here and we had a 1860 like aluminum boat that I, my dad would let me take out and then i also had a GNU. And then my best friend, at the, he, uh, he had a, at the time, a uh, Kenner. And so we had, we thought we really had the, we were like, man, look at these boats. You know, we have the lineup, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like boats that like snobby, like fly fishing guys, like, look at these guys over here, but we loved them and they were great boats to us. And, uh, and, but I was very like, it was just about like, how many can I catch? How many can I catch? And, um, fly fishing became about it's the same with archery. It's like, you still do want to catch fish, right? But you care about how you do it. Yeah. And you start to have like all these preferences about, I'm out here for my enjoyment and my enjoyment equals doing certain things a certain way. And so when I was younger, it was just all numbers, bragging, ego, and not that people can't have huge egos in fly fishing, because we obviously know that, but it became more about, no, I just really want to enjoy it. So, you know, like, I don't think, I fished my entire life and I don't think I ever slowed down and just said, man, look how beautiful this is until I was like 22. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, like yeah. I was just, I don't know. I was just going after it. No, I mean that definitely like that feeling, I don't think hit me until like, to be honest, like 31 Yeah, of being out there and just, you know, like taking a minute. Um, I know for me, like filming, like played a huge part into that of just, working with guys and you know you got to take the time with the fish and stuff mm -hmm. um and then you know afterwards you've done all the shots and stuff and you're like oh my god that was great and just let's just take a minute and enjoy it um but now like i mean we were out we've been we spent the last couple of days getting getting our butts handed to us a little bit yeah um that's just called fishing for me <laughs> That's fair. That was just normal for me. I, no. I think my problem was I came off of two of the best ta days in Texas that I've ever had in the springtime, and I was due for one. Um, but now you're not afraid. I mean, you don't have any issue picking up spinning, spinning gear. Do you think that like like when did that? I mean, do you think that played into having your daughters? Um, me being what being like, willing like, to pick up yeah. a spinning rod, or have you always been like that? No, I think I've always been like that. Um, I mean, I've definitely had a lot of days where, like, whether it's conditions or when I, I'm wanting to learn something where, especially early on where I was like, I'm just going to bring a, a spinning rod. And it was kind of like the metaphor of, like, the old story about there's a, a group of, I don't know, pirates or naval officers or whatever, and they, like, burn their boats. And they're like, we're going to go on the enemy's boats. And the kind of the phrase is burn the boats. Yeah. So... You know, I, I think when you're learning fly fishing, if you're having a hard time giving enough time to the fly rod, then maybe you shouldn't bring anything but a fly rod. But I mean, I'm at a point now where, 
you know, I, I like to have a spinning rod on. I don't, I don't see why I wouldn't have one on. Cause what if we're in a circumstance where, I mean, if it's me and you out there, maybe I get a backup shot and I'm not going to strip line from the pulling platform and do all that. It's going to be a circus up there. No, not, it, it immediately finds the motor every time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not half a good enough angler to do that. So I'll put like a, a spinning rod up there or sometimes like we'll have a moment in a certain area, a certain situation where like I'll use a search bait and just want to understand what's happening. Like, okay, are these fish, you know, like you might be pushing up on a shore and you're wondering, are they sitting off in this, you know, deeper water right here on the edge? Let me throw a spoon and see, Oh, just hooked one. Yeah. That's what's going on right now. Tide's coming up. Maybe this will happen. Maybe it'll come up and push up here. So it's still like a, I think using search bait is a really good way to learn an area. Yeah. So to me, it's just about, I enjoy learning and I enjoy sight fishing and I enjoy being out there, but you know, I want to have an understanding about what's happening too. And so sometimes blind casting a conventional reel is going to help you learn something that I don't know if you'd be able to with a fly rod. No, that's fair. I mean, that was like when we were fishing today and, and, or yeah today and you know you're like grab the spinning rod grab the spinning rod i mean you saw the hesitation that i had and i think like i'm just still in that i just thought like, you were having a stroke i was like you having a stroke <laughs> i didn't think it was like a i didn't think that you had like a big bias against like well what if someone sees me with this conventional reel no it, it honestly like i think i'm still in that phase of like learning fly fishing and so i want to do everything with fly fishing because i don't feel like i'm at a point where it's like oh yeah if i put like i'm gonna do this with a fly rod no matter what happens like i can you know grab the spinning rod it's a lot of pressure if you if you're listening to this and you're like i'm gonna be a fly only guy then you better be able to freaking cast better than me (laughs) Yeah, because if you're going to be above like because there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. I'm like, hey, whoa, I'm not a fly only guy. OK, yeah. you know, but when you're a fly only guy, you better be able to really bring it. It's like it's like it's like when you're like, I play guitar. I don't play drums. I don't play anything else. It's like you better be able to shred, man, shred. if you've dedicated all your energy into this one thing. But great. You know, I think like how ridiculous is it that if somebody's like if do what you want to do, like if you enjoy bow hunting, then man, get out there and bow hunt. Like if you enjoy fly fishing, get out there and fly fish, but stop worrying about what rod somebody else is using. Like it's different if you're carrying, you know, care about the ethics behind it or, or fish handling or whatever. But, you know, I think people, people put too much weight on it. And I think that what happens with fishing is that there's not for most people in most circumstances, there's not really a scoreboard and they don't really like, nobody's going to come to your house and like give you a trophy for being this amazing fly fishing person, unless you're doing tournaments or whatever exceptions like that. But for most people, it's not, not, there's no scoreboard. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, it's like, stop trying to be, you know, the Michael Jordan of fly fishing in your area. (laughs) Like, no, just go, go enjoy it. Go have fun. Go be, go be great because you want to be great, but don't be great so that you can be the dude looking down. I hate when I see people looking down on some high school kids out in the John boat and they're think they're all cool. Cause they have a, this, this shirt and this boat and this cooler and this, and like, no one cares, man. We were, we were talking about that a little bit when we were, we were rolled up to the gas station and there was like this dude, it was a sweet, like 14 foot baby blue John yeah. boat. And like, we were just like man what happened where like we got kind of got to, got to a point where we're, like you look at that and you're like these guys yeah but like i mean that's how we all grew up it when was, i was 16 years old my dad got me my first boat it was a gnu yeah. and nine horsepower and i also had a go devil which is basically a weed whacker with a prop on the back <laughs> and dude i cannot tell you how meaningful it was like to, to see my dad bring that boat to my house and then be like, man, I have, I felt like the world opened up for me and I could just go to the river. I could go to the lake. I could go wherever and fish. And that feeling as a 16 year old boy getting my first boat, man, like when I see kids like that, I'm like, man, I hope in my adult life I get another feeling like that. Yeah. So like how crappy of a thing to look down on somebody. And I didn't realize people were looking down on me. They were, they totally were. It's like shame on them for that, you know, because yeah. you know, it's like that, that is 
one of the purest things, you know. Yeah. And Just I hope I can give that to my kids one day. Whatever it takes to get out there. Yeah. No, I mean. I, I actually mean, look down on the kid that's 16 pulling up with a $70,000 skiff that his dad bought. Yeah. You know? And you're just. And like, yeah. It's like, man, I hope that you can just enjoy it for what it is. Yeah. You know, not status symbol or whatever. No, I mean, I, I rode around when I was in high school. I, uh, I did a lot of kayak fishing and I actually built a trailer that I could tow behind my bike so I could take the, take the kayak to the ponds around my neighborhood. And like those, like I look back on those days and I'm like, those are some of the best days of fishing. Yeah. And it was just simple. I want that spirit, you know, Yeah. the spirit behind that. If I can, if I can love fishing as much as I loved fishing and hunting at 16 for the rest of my life, it's all I could ever ask for. But it requires me not stressing about what everybody thinks about every (laughs) article of clothing I have on and all that stuff, you know, make sure that you're wearing all matching gear and all of your gear matches and all. Yeah, of course. Yeah, this guy's got mixed, mi- mismatched brands. What, what a, that guy must suck at He's fishing. He's never going to get reposted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, all right, man. That's important. Make sure it doesn't get edited out. People need to know that. That, that you have to wear the same brand if you want to get reposted by anybody. No, so along the lines, like with the spirit of fishing and everything, so you started with your podcast, which I want to get into a little bit, but with your podcast, you started traveling a little bit and like, do you, as you're traveling and you're fishing or everywhere you go, like, do you enjoy the fishing or the traveling more? I like both. I never, I definitely enjoy fishing more yeah. because I, I never am fishing and wishing I'm not fishing. Sometimes I'm traveling and I'm wishing I'm not traveling. Yeah. But I, when I went to Charleston, last time I went to Charleston, we went up there for an event. It was pretty awesome a, a, event with um, Paul Puckett up there and um, just a, a really great crew. And I went up there and went up there with, for a weekend with a couple friends. And we decided, like, we're just going to focus on food and pretend like I got weathered out. Yeah. And I would have got weathered out. So that was also nice because I think there's this thing in all of us when we're not fishing and we're walking around and like the weather's bad and we're like, oh, at least I'm not the only one not fishing today. I don't know. Like, it's just a weird thing. Maybe people don't want to admit it. Maybe it's just me, but, um, and I went up there and like focused on the travel aspect and the food and the culture and all that. And, and I really enjoy that. And I enjoy the time in the car, like just kind of sifting through. I'm, I'm, I tend to be somebody who can kind of get in my head and there's something peaceful to me about driving or flying or whatever. Um, driving's definitely more peaceful than flying. Cause I'm still like, I feel like I'm JV at flying. Like you see these guys in the airport and they got these like fancy roll in cases and you could just, you look at it and you're like, that guy travels a lot for sure. You know, like just, they just have like all the, the knickknacks and stuff and just know where they're going. Like I'm stressed. I'm like, what is like, what gate? Like, how do I get there? And like, am I getting on the right, you know, yeah. tram thing going, you know, so I just have a lot, a lot, a lot more stress with that, but, um, I definitely, I like both of them. And for me, like the podcast, I, did, I, I got to travel a little bit growing up, but you know, my dad worked for fish and wildlife commission and my mom worked for the state. She went back to college when I was in elementary school. So we didn't have tons of money. Yeah. So, you know, when we traveled, it was a really special thing. Um, and I'm really grateful for the trips and the opportunities that my parents made for me because I see the sacrifice more and more as I get older and parent, like I I realize, like my parents didn't do a bunch of things that they would have loved to do to save money so that I could go do that one duck trip, that one fishing trip. So to me, I'm really grateful for that, but I've traveled way more the past five years with the podcast than, you know, I've, I've traveled more the past five years than I traveled the 25 years leading up to it. Yeah. You've been doing the podcast five years, right? Yeah. Five years. How did that, how did that come about? How, like, like, like what is the story behind how you got that started? Like why, why did you start it? Yeah. Um, well for me, I had started listening to some podcasts. Like I listened to a podcast, Tim Ferriss show. It'd be like interviewing all these different interesting people. And, um, at, at the time there was a podcast called fish on the brain, which was really great. And then April Vokey had a podcast out at the time too. And she still does. And they're both great. 
Um, and, but I just like, I was kind of like, man, I kind of feel like I, I would like to just learn more. Like than just, I, I had listened to all of April's and all the fish on the brain podcast. And I kind of just had this appetite of like, man, it's just really great to, to learn from people who spend so much time on the water. And really the podcast was like my own learning journey. And, yeah. um, early on in some of the early episodes, like I have two of my friends, Austin and Josh with me, who I'm still friends with today. Austin's a game warden down in um, South Florida now and Josh, I still fish with Josh all the time. And, uh, you know, we just, it, it really just came from a place of like just wanting to meet people and learn and hear their stories and, and yeah, learn, learn about fishing, but also just learn about kind of the history behind things and the philosophy behind things. And, um, just give me an excuse to ha have fun, run around and meet people. So that's really where it came from. And I, I really like, I, I didn't think that it would do as well as it's done. Yeah. I just thought that I, I did it just for me. And that's like something that's really important for me now is really trying to just stay focused to that desire to say, this is, this is my own interest and journey that I'm going on and podcasting allows people to come along that and you start getting stressed about what other people want. Cause along the way, I'm sure you're already experiencing this. Everybody tells you what you should do and you want to listen, you want to learn in, but at the same time, like you need to be true to you and you don't want to wake up five years from now and say, I'm producing stuff and doing stuff for other people, but I don't love it anymore. Yeah. It's like, man, if I'm going to like do something I don't love, then I should go make a lot more money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I should go be like a, a, a dentist or something. No offense to dentists, but like, <laughs> you know, call them like, out like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're listening to this and you're a dentist, like I hope you love what you do or I hope that, you know, it gives you a great quality of life. But my, my point is if you're going to do something you don't love, man, like, don't do this. Go do, yeah. go, go do something way more lucrative and way more, way more family friendly. Um, but this is, this has been a great journey for me. Do you have any, um, I got two, two questions. We'll start with the, the, bat, the worst question. Do you have any moments during the podcast? Like, how do I want to phrase this? That stand out in your mind? Like that you're like, Oh no. Like, you know, does that make sense on that? Yeah, like almost like mess ups or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I was. Um, so Harry was here tonight at dinner yep. and Harry had called me because he lives right down the road from me. And uh, like I, I got to spend a lot of time with Harry during COVID because me and him built my skiff together. And that's a fun story. But um, Harry calls me on the phone. He's like, hey, man, my buddy Rick Ruoff's here. Like, you got to you got to come interview Rick, like come have dinner with us. We're going to cook and hang out and. So I go over there, I get to meet Rick, which is, is absolute legend. He's just the kindest, you know, kindest, most down to earth guy. And I'm sitting down interviewing, man, he's just like, I mean, sometimes you're interviewing you're like, this is a home run. You're not yeah. even doing anything. Cause you're just asking like little questions and then they're just, you know, running with it. And I knew it was a home run. I looked down at my recorder and like my battery died or something. See, you're looking at your recorder right now. <laughs> and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And I like, am like, so I have to, uh, Hey Rick, I'm so sorry. Like, can we just pick up at this question? Like, let me put some new batteries in or whatever. And, um, so I lost, there are like 15, 20 minutes of the Rick Ruhoff, um, podcast that are gone forever. And a lot of times when I do an interview, I'm so in my head, I'm trying to work on this, but like about the next question, the next thing that I don't really retain at all. So like when I go back to edit it and listen to it, I'm like, Oh, oh I didn't, didn't even remember. That's really good. You know? And like, there's like 20 minutes of like Rick Ruoff, an absolute, just such a kind person, just absolute legend sharing who knows what amazing information he was sharing. And it's just in a black hole right now just swirling around and I lost it. So that's probably, that's probably the worst one. Like, thank goodness I haven't had anything like too traumatic, but yeah, you know, that's, that, that's one I've had a couple, like had to re-record and stuff along the ways, but it happens. It's yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I mean, I've got one that's coming out soon. Well, it'll come out obviously before this that I managed to lose all of the audio files for. Did you just ask me that question to feel better about your audio? No, yeah. I didn't. Oh, I also ha I interviewed Alvin Dado and had a what's called electrical interference. And oh yeah, yep. I, and it messed up the podcast pretty bad. 
And then even um, Nikki with Millhouse uh, had the same thing happen. Yeah. Like, called me. It's like, is there any way out of it? And it's like, no, no. Um, just, what about like best like favorite moments? <sighs> yeah, I'll tell you like the moment early on. I'm really grateful that I had a moment that I was like, if if this is all that ever comes to this podcast, like I'm super happy. So one is like the first person I ever interviewed was Harry. Mm -hmm. And it's like, he's, he's in my own backyard. Like I'd seen him around on the water and stuff. And that was really meaningful. And Harry was really encouraging and has always been really encouraging of me. And, and just, uh, has always looked out for me. I'm really grateful for that. Um, but early on too, like we reached out to Bo Basso and he was like, yeah, like, if you can get down here next week, you know, come down and we can, we can do an interview and hang out. And so <clears throat> I don't know why I'm caught. I was coughing on the boat a bunch of days. You were. So anyway, so we go down, is that how you're going <laughs> to, is that how you're going to cut it? Yeah. So anyways, <laughs> <laughs> probably uh, going to leave all the coughing in. So anyways, <laughs> um, but I was like, if you can get down here, like, come down and this is very early on this is before i ever even released an episode i had recorded a couple episodes but i had not released any and so he's like you come down here record so me and josh hop in my wife's honda crv at the time it was the most reliable vehicle we had like you gotta realize when i started this thing the most reliable ve reliable vehicle i had was a 2004 honda crv it was like it ran on hopes and dreams and and you had, you had a bunch of them. Yeah. Yeah. I had two cars. That was the best one. So, um, and, uh, so we like wake up at 2 AM in the morning. So people like, like all the time, like, Oh, you go down the keys a lot. Like, you don't understand. I live up in the panhandle. Like it's not close. It's not close. It's like, it's like if, if you, you know, if you have a tailwind, no traffic and you're flying, right. And you're just hitting every, like, I mean, it's like, it's nine hours to get, you know, yeah. to get anywhere close to anything like that. And so we drive down, like we're like both running off three hours of sleep, do this interview with Bo, so gracious to let, let us um, hang out with him. And then we go get a, a hamburger at a place, a, a little local spot by his house. He's like, you guys want to go out and bone fish? We're like, you know, we don't have like, I don't have enough money to, we barely have enough money to get home. And we're like, uh, he's like, no, we just go out, like hang out. Like, so he took us out just for like two hours, but those, that trip, those two hours with Bo and just having that moment where it's like, I got to hear his story. I got to just learn from him, be around him like that to me. I was like, if that's all that I ever get out of this podcast, that's enough for me. And so on the way back, me and Josh are like, man, that was just such a great trip. And like, you know, I never, I never thought that people would be so generous and kind. Yeah. And along the way I've, I've made and some of them have become friends, like actual friends of mine. And, um, that was a, that was a, that was the first moment that I was really like, wow. Like I feel like I'm already getting fruit. Yeah. From, and you haven't even released one yet. No, I didn't even release one. And then when I released like the first five, like it's like I had Harry, I had a friend of mine, John Swanson, another local guy, um, Scott Burgess, um, and had uh, Harry, uh, Bo Basso, Rob Fordyce. Rob Fordyce still to this day gave what I believe is like one of the best interviews I've ever recorded. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, um, so yeah, just a really good front first lineup and, you know, so... Yeah, I think that's it for me. Yeah. No, I remember I I remember looking back at those like, man, this guy knows everybody in Florida that you need to know. Yeah. No, I had no clue. Now that you're uh now that you're 5 years into it, like well, like what are your thoughts on where you're at in kind of where do you see yourself going? Well, I like the I I I shared this with you on the boat today. I like to try to view myself like a little brother. Yeah. Like I'm having fun. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm learning a ton. I'm around great people, but like having the spirit of a little brother that wants to learn, you know, that's in a, I just, I've been around the industry for a very short amount of time comparatively to a lot of people who put in a lot of time. 
and I've already realized that the industry does not need another ego. Um, and so what the last thing I want to do is come off like, you know, some sort of hot shot. That's not, that's not the spirit of why I got into this. Like the people that I choose to spend time with are humble, fun, kind people. So for me, like I, I view it as like, I'm just a little brother that gets to run around and hang out with some really amazing guys and learn from people who are way better than me. And I'm not asking questions because I'm at the same place. I'm asking questions because I just, I want to learn. And, um, you know, so I think that's, that's where I'm at is, uh, very, very young in the fishing industry. If you want to use that term and trying to, and really just trying to, um, you know, keep humility in my, myself and, you know, the good thing with fishing is like fishing has a way of humbling us, right? God. Has a way of humbling me. But you I think know, the, I think the last two days speak to the hum- the humility yeah. that it puts in you. Yeah, so that's every day for me. <laughs> and um, and then like where I'm going, you know, I I just I what I what I really am focused on is like I I want to look back twenty twenty five years and be like, man, I'm so. I'm so happy with the decisions I made and the people I got to meet and spend time with and the experiences I got to have, you know, whatever that looks like, uh, you know, I'm not worried about dollar signs. I'm not worried about having the coolest sponsors or whatever. Like I can genuinely, genuinely say that all the, the people I do work with, like I reached out to them and got to know them and chose to work with them because I really like the people there. And, um, I hope that in the future to be highlighting more travel, to be highlighting stuff outside of just fly fishing and just to continue to have fun. And hopefully I think it'll, I think it'll resonate with people. Yeah. What, um, and I think honestly, you, you really touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to phrase it as a question and, and let you take it from there. Um, what advice like would you give to anybody that's thinking about, creating content in the fishing space it's a question i've asked other people a lot that are way ahead of me um i think one i think you got to make content that you love that you really love don't like don't worry about what everybody else is don't be derivative and just copying everybody else like you go to the fly fishing film tour and you see somebody else's thing and then you try to copy it like do, do something that comes from a place that like you can feel the real love and, and I can spot that. Like I'll see stuff sometimes. I'm like, man, that just came from somebody's heart. Like, it wasn't derivative from just you trying to be a beta version of somebody else. Yeah, like, yeah. It's like, it's a real deal. Um, and then I would say like, I was talking to you about this, but I think that, you know, you do have to realize that if you are going to try to create, even if you, it's just, just your personal Instagram or your photographer, your videographer, your podcaster, like, you know, you have a responsibility to, to do things well and to not overexpose. And I try to listen when people have concerns and I talk, I talked to you about this in the car, but I think like when somebody comes to you and they, they have something critical to say. My default is like defensiveness. I think most yeah. of us are. And so we're, we're like, Oh, you know, oh, who do you think you are? Like getting defensive. But then I try to say, hold on, like, let me just play some scenarios out in my head. Like, let's give this person the benefit of the doubt. And they have a concern about something I'm doing or the way I'm doing it. Like slow down and try to try to make sure you're not missing a lesson. Yeah. And I've had some people just say, Hey, be careful with this or Hey, you know, watch out for overexposing this thing or whatever it is. And I try to engage in that conversation, not in a way that's a pushover, but in a way that's like, you you don't want to be a pushover, but you don't want to push through feedback people are giving you or warnings that people who are older, who have gone before are giving you and totally miss out on the lesson and, and have to carry some regret that they have. And then, you know, when I slow down and I take the defensiveness down, a lot of times like, oh, yeah, I think they got a point there. Maybe, maybe I can really save myself some heartache here. Yeah. Do any of those lessons like that you've learned along the way, like stick out that you want to share? Yeah. Um, one of them is, you know, I had a, I had a conversation with a local guy who was just talking about, you need to be really selective with 
who you interview because yeah. you, whether you see it as an endorsement or not, it's an endorsement. And I was like, we were at dinner and he was like, Hey, like, you know, some of these guys are young, da da da. And I was like, well, you know, I want to interview people who are at different points in their career, which is true. I yeah. do. Like, I don't want it to just be, Hey, if you haven't guided for 25 years and have a hundred articles written about you, I don't want to interview you. So I want to, I, I want to like have this attitude of, I can learn from anybody at the same time, if I'm going to interview somebody, I'm going to increase the awareness around them. And right. I, I realized like I need to give more thought at the time. I was like really in my mind, just trying to get outside of the box and you know, I'm not going to name any specific names, but I, I think that, you know, I could have been more selective with some of that. And, um, that person was right. And I told you this, they didn't like the easiest thing for that person to do would just be to say nothing. And then whenever they talk about me to other people, just be like, that guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. Da, da, da. That's the easiest thing. Like he actually gave me some feedback to my face that after I thought about it a little bit, I was like, no, he's got a point. Like, yeah. you know, like I think there's, I think there's some truth there and I'm grateful for it. You know, that's definitely something like I experienced right out the gate. I experienced that before I even started skiff wander. I started to experience some of, some of that. And I mean, it's, you know, like we were talking today about, you know, tomorrow is going to be rained out and, um, you were giving me some ideas of what to do and, and where to go. And, like a, a lot of like where I've had, I mean, you probably noticed I've had a lot of reservations about mm -hmm. just taking off and running. And that's where a lot of it comes from is I'm like, man, I like, I don't know these guys at all. And like, I know that you know them and, and I do trust you, but it's like, I just, like I've, ha I've had that conversation with enough people that like, it makes like when you are creating content, it's like, you know, it makes you think twice. And I'm probably, I probably overthink that a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit because there's the other thing that um, as I've got to know you over the years that I think is um, speaks to, your, to you and your character a lot is um, you're 100% like you do all of this, you're on the road, you do podcasting, but at the I think like this is almost second to your family. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I, that I really look up to you for and um, like there's a question in here, I promise. What advice would you like give somebody that, you know, they're trying to juggle those two things? Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely want this to be like second to family, no yeah. doubt. And that doesn't mean that there won't be times that I go fishing or I go on a trip and it's not hard, you know, it doesn't, but it does mean that to me, I don't want my daughters. I have two daughters. I have a six year old and a three year old. I don't want them to like ever wonder did he love fishing more than me and did I get in the way of his dream? Like, yeah. because, you know, to me, my dream is my family is my dream, you know, and that's not at odds with traveling and fishing and wanting to be the, the angler and podcast or whatever that I want to be. But to me, like I, I definitely, I definitely have learned that from people who've come before me and it's just not something that, you know, do I want to be, you know, did you ever see the movie, uh, couples retreat? Did you ever see that movie? It's, with it's Vince been Vaughn? a hot minute. Yeah. They're I've like seen arguing it. and they're like, you're going to be at Applebee's sitting alone, you know, <laughs> talking about how awesome you were in high school. And it's like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be like 80 years old and had neglected my family and be like, man, my podcast was really popping back in the day. And they're like, what's a podcast? Cause it's all temporary. Like it's temporary, right? Like right. this moment is this, this whole thing, like no matter how big you get, no matter what you do, like, you know, you're not, you're not going to be immortal in people 200 years from now are probably not going to be talking about this podcast. But like the goal for me is like, 20 years from now, my daughters are at my house and I have a healthy relationship with them. And so I try to keep that in mind. You know, I think that's yeah. really important. And, you know, I, I made a choice to get married and start a family and like, I'm going to, 
I'm going to make that my first priority. Like I said, I would, I'm going to, I'm not going to let a, a fish or whatever get in the way of that, you know? And th there's some things that will look different as the kids get older or, you know, things change. But I think, I think that like my encouragement would be to like, you know, if anybody that spent time with people who are older understand the hardest regrets to carry are the ones with your family. Yeah. So, well, I mean, both of, both, both of your daughters have, been asking when they get to go back out on the boat again while i've been here for two days yeah they're both itching so i think you're gonna you're gonna end up where both of them are gonna be traveling with you to go fishing yeah i hope so yeah it'd be pretty cool yeah and and you know i i said this on the dads on the fly podcast but like the outdoor world has its own version of pageant mom and dad you know <laughs> Or like you're forcing your kid. You're like, look at my kid. You know. Yeah, yeah. He's like, what, what, a, what a archery legend. You know. But like the kids, like it's like you know, it's like in a training facility all day, and you like, you know, you squeeze the love out of it. Yeah. So you know, I'm with my daughters. My plan is to do what my dad did with me. Like, try to expose them to a bunch of different stuff, and then it's like it's like whenever you're starting to fire and you see a little ember. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> blow it and it goes out and you go all right let's find a new one <laughs> and you know like i look back and man i'm just so grateful for for my parents and the the way that they did that and the sacrifices and i'm glad like i mean people all the time are like everybody's like i wish i would have been fly fishing when i was six years old so because you know then i would never blow a cast and i would dude i'm glad I, i'm glad I, I didn't i'm glad that i got to experience the variety of things I experienced and I'm glad that I got to see my parents love me and fan that flame and all those different things as it came in and out. Cause if it would have just been like monocentric, mm -hmm. I don't know if I would have felt the same love and support in a way yeah. like to, to be like, okay, like what is it this year? What's it going to be this year? Ducks. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Just so, just, yeah, I think that's, I, I, I think that's, that's my hope for my girls. Like I fly fished when I was in high school and I got away from it for a long time. And I, I honestly like look at, you know, you were mentioning like getting kids into it really early and pushing really hard. Like if I hadn't gone through everything I went through in college and after college, I, I wouldn't have the appreciation I have for it. And my, my parents kind of like yours, like they introduced me to as much as possible. And in the end, like, you know, I, I left the outdoors for a little while and came back to it even stronger. And mm -hmm. the whole time like that, I kind of like ventured, veered off away from it. Like they were never like, you need to be going fishing. Like they were just like, he's going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, it's, it's really cool. I think, you know, and not just to see your family, but like you guys have the community that, that those girls are growing up in down here is. I mean, you know, it's a Monday night and you had what seven, eight guys over at the house. They're all fishy, fishy yeah. dudes. And I try to be the le least that. fishy person in the room. Always. And th you know, there's a saying that like, if you're the smartest person in the room, you need a different room. Yeah. Like I, I really do apply that today yeah. at the dinner table. Like I legitimately believe that at the table that we sat at, I was the least fishy person and that's fine. Cause like. Once again, nobody's going to show up to the most fishy person's house next next year and say, hello, hello we all got together, yeah. and we'd love to present you with the most fishy man award. <laughs> but um, I really want to like go to a trophy shop and send that to you. Yeah. And like one of my, you know, like back to, back to my relationship with Harry, like one of my favorite photos like this in my house is this photo of Parker Ray, who's, so, you know, my daughter Parker is named after my dad runs a Parker Big Bay. That's like the boat he guides out of. So yeah. she's named after his boat, right? And I have this photo of her and she's sitting in um, my Everglades gift as it was being built. Yeah. And Harry's like leaning over and just this really special moment where, you know, to me too, like I, I try to do what I'm doing in a way that invites my family in. And yeah. um, unfortunately, sometimes when I make mistakes, I make scheduling mistakes, I overbook myself, whatever. Like it, it, there's, they feel the consequences, but also when things are going well, they, they get a chance to feel the, the benefits and like nights like tonight where everybody's together and laughing and my daughters are like, let me show you my one wheel cartwheel and <laughs> one, one wheel, one hand cartwheel. I don't know what a one wheel cartwheel is, but, uh, you know, and it's like, everybody's just having fun and learning and debating and 
you know i heard my dad like firing off at the end of the table some debatable things so but it's all it's all good and my kids grew up around it and they'll feel hopefully they'll feel the love that i feel you know what i thought about doing i'm not going to do it but i did think about doing and i'm going to leave this in there anyways i uh and i I should have wrote some of them out, but I, I honestly thought about like listening to your podcast and writing out a bunch of your rapid fire questions just to see if you could do it. Yeah. I think, but I didn't see if I could do, see uh, if you could actually do rapid fire rapidly. Yeah. That's like, that's like, I, I, it, it cracks me up every time and I'm glad that you've stuck with it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, it's rapid fire sounds better than, okay. Like we're rims. towards the end of the like podcasts and I like have no way to string all this together. Yeah. Nor does anyone care about my like artistry of like, ah, you know, look at how he's seen that. Together. Yeah. Like speaking of your favorite sunglasses, how do you see yourself? You know, it's like, okay, it's cringy. So just rapid no. fire. No. Um, maybe it should be called random fire. No, I like it the way it is. Yeah. And I know I just got off on some random tangent there. What led you to, starting that segment because I, like, it cracks me genuinely, up genuinely like it was not supposed to be funny it was just <laughs> like how do i how do i ask this question and then this what seems like such a like how do i ask you about you know the most important piece of gear that you bring on a trip and then ask you about like if you could only catch one i don't know like it's just like it, it just has to do with the randomness between the questions and I'm not like actually trying to like make somebody say something super short, but also sometimes I'll ask somebody a question and this is great. And they'll like spend 10 minutes. Like I have podcasts where I, it's, it's an hour long podcast and my audio is five minutes. Yeah, no, that, that actually, um, so it's like, I can't like ask, I have three more questions to ask you and we only have 30 minutes. That is something that, I did not realize when I started a podcast is that not everyone is good at talking. Yeah. Into like you can sit there with a guy on a boat for an entire day and you're like talking and you're chatting and everything and you're like, all right, we're gonna sit down and do a podcast yeah. and then you're like, so like how like what do you find meaningful in fishing? And they're just like, um, when the tide comes in. And you're like, Yeah. That's can you I mean, you've noticed, yeah. like, I have, like... Oh, 100%. Like, I mean, obviously, if you're listening to this, there's a lot of edited out giant pauses because I lose train of thought real easily. Yeah, it's it's less noticeable on a boat, though. Yeah. You're like, yeah. Hmm, do you see one? No? Oh, That's, so no, you just is, zoned out. Okay. I'm, I'm going to give you, like, I'm going to give the world... Like, one of the things that I've done one so far and I want to do more of is, like... Like we were talking about when it was raining the other day, like, man, we should just throw a tarp up into a podcast. Like, I want to do more like podcasts yeah. like that. Like just like on the spot in the middle yeah. of nowhere. Fish on a brain did one on the, um, on a boat one time. Yeah. Like that was years ago. I've done one with a buddy around a campfire and that actually is like, I've gotten the most like, dude, that was sick. Yeah. But I mean, it, this studio is going to be. You're st I like the studio thing too. Yeah, it's gonna be up there. Yeah, uh, I, is this uh, the first one that's ever been filmed in here? Kind of. Damn it! Is that like, like how like I bizarre I of a question? Is this the first time for you? Kind of, you know <laughs> how vague. But like, yeah, I, I yeah, I think that the reason is it goes back to what we said that you're trying to like bring people along with you, and as they're mowing their grass or as they're driving to work. For a moment, they feel like they're having a beer or an all hands with somebody and they're getting to know them. And that's a fun, that's a like enjoyable thing, you know? So, um, and for me, I just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't well connected. I'm, you know, like I, I didn't know a lot of these people before I reached out to start networking. You know? And luckily for me along the way, there's been some people who believe in what I'm doing, which sounds super dramatic, but like they care about me and they believe what I'm doing and they want to help me and they introduce me to people and that turns into genuine connections and friendships. It's been like, like for me knowing you and seeing what you're doing and then like kind of taking my own leap into the industry. It's been cool to watch you and then what everything you just described, like I've, I've genuinely in the last six months started to somewhat experience mm -hmm. and it's like, 
I think like remember when we we were at Baracho yeah. last year and you were like, Hey, let me introduce you to somebody so I can't remember who it was. And like we walk up and you introduce me and they like no they like knew what I was doing and everything and it was just like like I was in genuine shock. You like called your mom. You're like No, I did. I made it, mom. Well, I didn't say that. But yeah. it was it was definitely a like I guess I'm doing something good or decent. Yeah. Um someone I looked up to has looked at me. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's I don't know. It's I don't know where I'm going with it. But it's I know exactly where you're going. It's like the hot girl in school. Like it's like you thought about her. <laughs> For 25 hours a day, you know, and you make eye contact with her and you go like, maybe for three seconds, she just thought of me. That's where you're going. Cause like for me, like, and I think talking to you too, it's the same way. Like, I just want to go fishing Mm -hmm. and just, and, and for me at least like, like, like I'll go on trips with my wife and I film it just cause I love filming Yeah, and trying to write a, you know, write a story out from it. But. No, no, it's weird. I love fishing too. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> Even I, 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 I love a lot of things. <laughs> you know, I love my dog. He's sleeping over there. That's the I most I've seen sit still. I love this beautiful piece of art here. Love a lot of things. I'm a big lover. Big you, lover. We're gonna we're gonna touch on this real quick. Um, you love making pizza. Yeah. I want to. Can like, we talk about that pizza that you made the other night, real quick? Yeah, we could break it down. I just want to say that for me, I, I try to like, if I, everything I do, I try to just like, I love training my dog. I love, I just, I want to surround, like I have a little garden, I have citrus trees. I like, I I just have fun with it. And I think that's really important in life. Um, and you know, it's like the, the saying artists are just children who survived or something like that. (laughs) Never. I like that. Well, I didn't come up with it. I think I messed it up, but somebody can can submit the correct one. But the principle of I think really successful people in in a lot of ways are they hold on to something from like just like I see my kids and just how they love things. And it's like I just want to continue to love things the way that child does. And I think that's really helpful in life. But the pizza that you liked was one, you got to have a real pizza oven and by real pizza oven i just mean you need a stone that you can heat up super freaking hot like yeah. you like like this whole 500 degree oven is not gonna cut it like that's the giorno you know <laughs> it's not delivery it's the giorno it's like i don't want delivery either you yeah. know like whoever came up with that is like no not on delivery <laughs> pizza but it's like it's not that good you know like nobody's like how good do you want to be as a lawyer one day i want to be delivery pizza good you know <laughs> like nobody like people talk about like i had the best pizza of my life in you know this little place in new york or whatever right like they're not like like that's a low standard it's like congrats your delivery good you know <laughs> but like you need to have like a real pizza oven so like i have an uni mm-hmm. uh, i'm not sponsored by them i don't i don't want to be sponsored by them i don't care but like i have an uni and i like it and i have a propane one because all the other ones seem like they would just be too much work. And, um, and so like that's super key. And then we make our own dough, which we've done a bunch of different recipes and all of them are way better than most pizza that you're going to eat. Like just homemade yeah. fresh dough. I got to um, send If you remind me, I'll send you a recipe. Okay. A dough recipe. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you make your own dough, just cowboy up, do it. And then, um, but the, the pizza ingredients themselves are, a Traeger sweet heat. I'm not with Tra- like working with Traeger anymore, but I still have, I showed you, like I still have like an t- insane <laughs> amount of like Traeger sauces and rubs and stuff because yeah. I think Traeger thought that I like cooked more than I really do. It's like, it's just a family of four cooking three meals a day. Like, um, but no, I, I, so the Traeger sweet heat barbecue sauce is absolutely incredible. And then we put pineapples, we put a little bit of bacon, we put a little bit of, um, we actually put a little bit of sausage on that one and, uh, that's it. Like, you know, some goat cheese or some mozzarella cheese, but, um, the key, I think that like nobody eats a, like eats a Hawaiian pizza and it's like, Oh my gosh, best pineapple ever. Like yeah. it's there and you taste it. It's the sauce and it's the Traeger sweet heat. I'm not paid to say that. I'm just telling, I'm just telling you right now 
but no, that, that sauce is the jam for Hawaiian. That was the first Hawaiian pizza that I ate that I didn't feel like I was eating Hawaiian pizza. Yeah, that is that a compliment? Does that make sense? Man, that feels like it's not a compliment, though. It's supposed to be. I don't know. That's I, like it, kissing to, a girl saying, this is like kissing a girl, but it doesn't better. feel like it's kissing a girl or something. Like, you know, like, all right. Like, you know when you go get Hawaiian and it's just like, oh, here's a regular pizza that yeah. they threw pineapple on top yeah, of. Yeah, because it's dom. It's not, it's it's, not it's, it's it's <laughs> Jorno, dude. <laughs> It's not delivery, it's DiGiorno. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's like, like way, everything, like, it's just, everything gets over-sauced, over-cheesed, over-greased, and it's just like, and it's a gut bomb. Yeah. <laughs> and my lactose intolerance, my tolerance <laughs> towards lactose is decreasing. <laughs> it's another story, another day, but I have to be select, I'm a selective lactose eater. Yeah. So I eat goat cheese a lot. Which is also another Which ingredient. Which I guess doesn't have lactose. I, don't, I honestly don't even, I'm becoming lactose intolerant i don't even know what lactose is i also feel like that we should real quickly goat cheese is an undervalued pizza ingredient yeah because that was people need to know yeah that's why i agreed to this podcast people need to know we're here to talk about goat the cheese goats, on pizza <laughs> the goats make cheese to people <laughs> all right the last question i got one more question for Thank you goodness we're not like ending on that one i feel like what a do you weird... want to? No, no. I think uh, like, what a weird thing for me to end on. Because I have like a I have like a last question that I'm supposed to, that like I'm like this is gonna be the skiff wanderer question that he asks everybody at the wow. end of the podcast. Wow. And I'm about fifty percent on doing it. So does it have to do with goat cheese? It might. It depends on your answer. Do you work for the goat the goat farmers union? Okay, you ready? Yeah. All right, if you could go anywhere in the world to fish, where would it be and what would you be fishing for? Oh, wow. See? You see where you could work goat cheese into that? Yeah, of course. There's goats everywhere. Yeah. Where would I want to be? I would want to be with my family fishing for fun. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be, like, good. I know, but that's like... Um, no, uh... So it's weird because it's like the thing that's like in my head because maybe there's like a rich sugar mom or sugar daddy that's like, I'm going to make this come true for him. So I'm trying to like really think about this. Yeah. yeah there's yeah. some rich sugar Smart. mamas and some sugar daddies out there. Maybe listen. It's like, do I want to go somewhere that I went that I had a great experience or do I want to go somewhere I've never been? So I'll say I've, I've been in talks with, and that's like, a, that makes it some like it's more evolved than even it is but like i would love to go to seychelles yeah um it just seems like a really amazing experience and i feel like half the fish that i've seen i've never seen <laughs> so that's cool that makes sense that's like what is this it's a such and such is it a good one <laughs> yeah it's a world record <laughs> awesome man <laughs> <laughs> or they could lie to me. They'd be like, oh, that's a great one. It'd be like, you know, catching a tw 20 inch redfish. Oh, my. Oh, the, oh 20 inch. You need to tell someone. Uh, that's also known I, as a Texas redfish. 20 inch red. Wait, what? You guys have small redfish. Everybody knows it. Y'all have wow. small redfish syndrome. You, did you see my banner up here? Don't mess with Texas, but definitely don't F with Florida. It's got a gator skull. I just. You're the first Texas Texan to see that. I only get jumped at Baracho Pescador next year. Because they say don't mess with Texas, but I don't know who they are, and I don't know why they say it. <laughs> but, okay, Seychelles. Wow. And no, the, I just feel If I could go back to somewhere. Right no, well, just relax. <laughs> just relax, man. Um, if I could go back somewhere that I've been, uh, it would definitely be Pelican Chandelier. What, what an amazing yeah place it was just like perfect it was like not it wasn't too fancy which can make me uncomfortable and then it was also just so much fun like eight guys hanging out on a houseboat chasing all sorts of species of fish and just loaded up and like n n barely any other boats in sight like half the boats in sight that you did see were just like floating around catching trout just crushing trout and you're like you're just like because I love it, man. Like, have a yeah, great yeah. day, dude. But, like, 
what we were wanting to do, we had all to ourselves. And that was, it was just a, like, so that was, take me back there. You know, that's my death row fishing trip. Yeah. Sweet. Um, yeah, that's, that's how you should ask it. What? Death, if what's you your were death on death row, row they're going to let you go on a three day fishing trip. Jeez. What's the one person you're going to fish with? I wonder if you were on death row, you know, you get a last meal. Yeah. I wonder if you could like work that out. Do you really? Has anyone confirmed that? I no. Well, uh, all right. I need somebody to confirm <laughs> okay. that because because we always say that, but it's like. But I, what I, what I'm gonna say is like I wonder if you could be like I want to eat a tuna that I caught myself. No, who's this guy? Who is this guy on death row that's like prepping all these meals? <laughs> well, I, don't I don't think, think it's a thing. I don't think it's we a say death that, row but I don't guy think it's a thing that you get. Oh, There's like some meal? guy at the prison that's like, okay, like Pete's gonna die tomorrow. I gotta go get him out back. Like I don't think I don't. That's what somebody I'm saying. Fact well, check me. I just I'm just telling you I don't believe everything I hear. If it is a real thing, I think that I would be like I want to go eat a tuna that I caught myself. Yeah. And so then they go, all right, well we gotta get him a fishing trip. <laughs> yeah. No man, um, I appreciate you having me down here and uh, taking the time to take me fishing. Yeah, that was really nice of you, and uh, to sit down and talk a little bit about everything you got going on, and also um, kind of all the help and support that you've given me over the years. Not for sure. And uh, I gotta get you out to Texas. You gotta, you gotta come to Texas. I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna show you some fish that aren't little. That's what they all say. <laughs> and bring your dad. Sure thing. If you want to, I want to. I, I, I do want to say that I did see some decently large redfish with Owen Gaylor. I want to give Owen that credit because there's well, a, he, there's a chance that it? Owen. No, I don't think he won it. Did him and Paul win it? I didn't fish him in the tournament. I don't know. Him and Paul normally come into the top three. So I want to say that those were some salt. If Owen's listening to this, those were some salt. You're like shaking your head. No, he's not. He's not. <laughs> but he might. Somebody he knows might. And I saw some decent redfish. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> they were decent, you know. I know where some are. Solid on a scale of one to ten, some solid sevens. I don't, like, how big is a solid seven? Solid seven? I don't know. Mid thirties. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, like, till next time. Till till you till you can't stand. <laughs> What's a ten? Ten's like, you know, forty five, forty six inches. Okay. You can't stand holding it. <laughs> I'm six foot three, two hundred and fifteen pounds. Like I want to have to like be seated. Yeah. I don't care. I That's honestly a, don't care. I just a solid ten is not about the size of the fish. It's about the. You know, I took it's a, the size of the experience. I just feel like I took a chance coming to Florida to podcast with you guys and the first person i podcast with in florida is just attacking texas no way nobody attacks texas <laughs> <laughs> somebody needed to honestly all the states got together we're like guys texas is just out of control oh my god uh, that's what we said when you guys weren't there <laughs> we all got together like all the you know what they say about oklahoma hmm. it's just okay yeah. I have been to Oklahoma. I have too. I've never it's, fished Oklahoma. It's really pretty. I didn't see any water while I was in Oklahoma. I went riding around sand dunes. They had a cowboy museum. It sounds about right. And they had I think I think they had a Quiznos. <laughs> I'm sure there's a casino attached to the Quiznos. And I did not see any water. I know the uh, I'm just joking. Oh, I guys. stayed on a lake there. It's late at night and I'm just feeling funny, so I'm just making jokes. But you know, I'm sure there's some fine fishing in Oklahoma. I can't wait to explore. <laughs> so I was like, screw this guy. I, I would be. I don't think anybody from Oklahoma listens. To this. Oh wait, I might know one person. That's awesome. And they smallmouth bass fish there. That's cool. No, they leave and they go to Arkansas. Yeah, you're right. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> go out of town. <laughs> Arkansas is off the chain though. Yeah. I'm supposed to go there in later this year. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. I'm gonna tear it up. My dad went last year for a month, yeah. tore it up, took a month off, 
and went to Arkansas and was sending us all these photos of all these fish he was catching. Just absolutely annihilated fish. All sorts of species. Multi-species. He was catching so. trout bigger than a Texas redfish. <laughs> 15 inch trout i knew we should have done this in the morning yeah definitely definitely a different persona in the morning but uh no nah, man i appreciate it and uh i'm looking forward to oh, i messed that up what are you looking forward to man <laughs> <laughs> don't edit that out man. <laughs> people need to see those existential moments <laughs> Man, I'm looking forward to And you're just like, oh, what am I looking forward to? Because we've all been there, man. We've all been sitting there going, what am I looking forward to? Man? <coughs> Don't edit that out, man. I'm be looking be forward brave. To, I'm looking forward to bed. Be be brave and, and keep that in, dude. I just want you to know that my bedtime is 9 o'clock, and we started this at 9.30. Yeah, well, I want you to know Texas is a different time zone. You're in Eastern now, so. That doesn't help. Yeah, it does. No, because it's, it's nine o'clock in Texas. No, it's ten o'clock. Texas is an hour behind. Yeah, it's eleven o'clock right now. Oh, okay. So you're saying it's ten o'clock in Texas? Yeah. Here's what I'm saying to you. Hmm. It's five o'clock somewhere. We'll end on that. Yeah. I was out, but I pretended like I still had some. <sighs> We really could just end it there. That's a great ending. Okay. Bye. Sweet.